Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, the Roswell 2012 Conference is happy to present our next speaker, Karen Green, curator of the Smithsonian Affiliated National Atomic Testing Museum located in Las Vegas, Nevada. As the curator of one of the uh, handful of private nonprofit national museums, Karen oversees the museum's permanent and temporary exhibits and the collection. She has been a curator for over 20 years. <laughs> Karen designed the National Atomic Testing Museum's extremely popular exhibit about UFOs in Area 51. The exhibit titled Area 51, Myth or Reality, enables museum visitors to learn more about America's most secret military installation. Over four years in the making and developed with assistance from individuals who actually worked at the secret base, the exhibit explores both the myths and the reality of Area 51 and addresses the secrecy that surrounds it. The audience is encouraged to take a walk down the extraterrestrial highway and experience this interactive, educational, and entertaining exhibit where visitors decide for themselves what is myth and what is reality. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Karen Green. radiation that went on to Area 51. 
uh, it was in the fallout pattern because the pattern for fallout off of the test site is north and east, kind of towards Utah. The one thing about Area 51 is, when I started looking at it, is how do I, as a historian and a curator, actually put together an exhibit on a place that's top secret? And that was a question that I was trying to answer. Well, we're going to show you. video you're going to see uh, one year prior to our opening in March 26. So it gives you an idea of the kind of timelines we have. This is a 30 second video. on March 26th. So Area 51, this is how our latest exhibit was actually done. It's called Myth or Reality. It actually started out as reality but along the way, we needed to come up with some myths. So I'm going to start telling you about the reality side. It was four years in the making. We had to have a cast of characters because it's always more important to have real people talk about it, which meant I had to go out and build relationships. So who was I going to build a relationship with? So the first contact was with Roadrunners International and T.D. Barnes. T.D. came to the museum one day, and this was about five, six years ago. And he started talking to me. I had no clue who he was. I get people that come in all the time and talk about their experiences. And T.D. said, um, I used to work out at uh, Groom Lake. And I said, Groom Lake, what's that? And he said, Groom Lake, you know, Paradise Ranch, the box. Dreamland. And I went, I have no clue what you're talking about. And he said, Area 51. And I said, oh, I think that's classified. You're really not supposed to tell me about that. And he said, well, I'm going to tell you about it. TD was the head of an organization of men who worked on the projects that were becoming declassified at Area 51. And so TD wanted a place in Nevada, where the people who had worked years in Nevada could talk about their experiences. So we held a symposium, and in the symposium, 250 workers from Area 51 came. There was the YouTube program. We had three of then four living YouTube pilots that came. Project Oxcart. YF-12A, SR-71, 
reverse engineering and stealth technology. These are all things that are associated with Area 51, and we had the people that developed the projects, worked on the projects, and were willing to talk about the projects. Oh my God, that really happened, I must be dead. <laughs> I really, that went through my mind. Uh, and I was like, gosh, don't feel bad being dead is so bad, what's, what's everybody worried about? And then I became fully conscious, and I, Realize, my God, I'm out of the airplane. This is a video clip of Bill Weaver. Bill Weaver um, actually was in a crash at the YF-12A. This is from one of our lecture series uh, this year. But Bill talked about um, his experience actually crashing one of the experimental airplanes. The YF-12A is the fighter interceptor version of the A-12, which is the the precursor to the SR-71. There are a number of planes that were developed at Area 51. Um, the Raptors, the Raptor, the Bird of Prey, SR-71 is probably one of the more famous ones, and of course stealth technology. This is Tony, one of the U-2 pilots. And the U-2, the U-2 was one of the most unstable airplanes ever flown. Its stall speed and its maximum cruise speed are 12 miles per hour difference. This is the David Clark Company. The David Clark Company developed the flight pressure suit, which we have it at our, uh, we have one of the U-2 flight pressure suits, one of the early ones in our exhibit. Um, the pressure suit was developed so that the pilots would not have their blood boil or freeze, they, they wouldn't have decompression sickness. They had to breathe pure oxygen, and the oxygen was, they breathed uh, for one hour prior to. Every pilot on one of the experimental plane programs had a doctor that lived with them in the barracks, and that doctor would not only check them physically, would make sure that they were suited up correctly, they would also check them psychologically. As soon as it made contact with the oxygen, the TEV, it ignited and it would ignite the fuel. Because the JP-7 was not real flammable. That was JP-7, the fuel that we used. Uh, you could have a bucket of fuel and throw a match in it, it wouldn't burn. So this is refuting one thing that Dennis said about um, the SR-71 leaking. This is Ken Collins, the most decorated pilot of the SR-71. Ken survived ejecting from an SR-71 at 60,000 feet upside down, and he's part of our exhibit. He's talking about the specialized fuel. It was a fuel injection system. The, the fuel itself was developed so that it would not burn with matches, so it, didn't, it wasn't highly flammable. Area 51. You see a whole lot of uh, things about it. This is Peter Merlin. Peter Merlin is one of our experts. Pete is um, an no, aviation. No, 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 Pete is an historian for the Roadrunners International. He's an aviation historian. He's an ex-plane hunter. He's hunted every one of the crashes of experimental planes. He has a new book out called Images of Aviation from Area 51 Declassified. And this is part of Pete's lecture at our, our museum. This is one of the Mount Charleston plane crash artifacts. This is from a group called Silent Heroes of the Cold War. What happened is that a plane carrying uh, most of the scientists and engineers working on the U-2 crashed on Mount Charleston outside of Las Vegas. Um, it was a top secret crash. Nobody could go up there. Uh, unfortunately, you could actually see the smoke. The TV and the, the newspaper uh, reported the crash. 
It took 20 hours for the sheriff's posse on horseback to get to the crash site. This is one of the museum's artifacts. We have a couple of them. The silent heroes of the Cold War under Steve Ryrie have brought down a lot of the other debris from the crash. And in our exhibit, we talk about the fact that the loss of the 14 people in this plane crash almost stopped the U-2 program in its, in its uh, steps. But the other thing is that for four decades, their families didn't know what happened to them. These guys received paychecks from vendor companies. If a wife wanted to know what her husband did, she had an emergency number to call. It would be answered by a fictitious company or a company, but it wasn't really what they were doing. Steve Rarie's mission in life became uh, letting the families know exactly what happened to these people. So when we got the reality together, we started to think, what else do we want to put in here? And how can you talk about Area 51 if you don't talk about the myths? And so we started looking at the myths, and we decided that we were, our approach as a museum would be, let's find out the realities about the myths, and then see where we can go from there. So we started out, men in black, there's so much people say, oh well, you know, they're CIA, they're US Air Force, 1967, it was reported that they don't belong to any agency, Project Blue Book. So we decided that we would just take a man in black and make him a guide. And remember, Everything you're about to see and do here is classified, so don't tell anyone. We also needed to have somebody else who was um, Las Vegas's probably best known UFO reporter. When I got George Knapp to join our team as one of the researchers, I was extremely excited because George, of course, has started a lot of the international involvement in the UFO phenomena. My name is George Knapp. I'm an investigative reporter. I've been a journalist for about 32 years here in Las Vegas. I've chased everything from political corruption to organized crime, but probably till the day I die, I'll be known as the UFO reporter because for the past 25 years, I've been investigating stories about Area 51. George invited us to his house. He invited me to go through his files. He actually has, this is just part of one room. He has about 20 rooms in his basement that are just full of stuff. George opened up his archives. He opened up his interviews. He opened up um, his expertise to us. And of course, George, has been a huge part of not only the publicity for it, but actually getting the credibility that a museum, a national museum wanted, doing this particular type of an exhibit. George became famous uh, in the UFO circles when he started talking about Bob Lazar. And um, Bob Lazar and George's interviews are when the Roswell Area 51 whole UFO thing became an international story. International press came to cover all of this. But Bob Lazar had some problems. He didn't check out. But did he or didn't he? One of the things they said about Bob Lazar was that he said he worked at Los Alamos. And then the government said, no, he didn't. Well, we actually have an artifact in this exhibit that proves Bob Lazar did work at Los Alamos. Bob Lazar said it was Element 115. Element 115 was isolated this last year. Bob Lazar talked about anti-gravity propulsion. The UK, this last year, actually started anti-gravity propulsion experiments. So, What's, what is it here? It was Bob Lazar credible, is he not? One of the things we're really hoping to do is Bob and uh, George may actually come to the museum 
and talk a little bit more about everything you said. The Russian Roswell incident artifacts. These are something I didn't expect to have, but in the course of going through George's house and carting out boxes and talking to George over a period of time, he started talking about going to Russia and interviewing people at the Russian Roswell incident. And then he said, uh, would you like some artifacts? And I said, what kind of artifacts, George? You know, I'm thinking I'm gonna get some paper or something. And he said, um, how about some pieces of the crash? And I went, you have some pieces? And he said, yeah, I got some. So one of the things that we do have on our exhibit are pieces of the crashed, um, analyzed crashed um, site debris from the Russian Roswell incident. I also just received, and we keep changing our exhibit, but I also just received some artifacts that are from another purported um, UFO crash. And I have two sides of that story too. So we had some myth, and we had our reality, and then you have to build an exhibit. We had to design the thing, and it changed seven, eight, nine times um, when you go from myth to reality and reality to myth. But building the exhibit actually talk, took over six months. And here you see some of the people that are building it. We painted murals. We built 63 walls. We wanted to set an atmosphere. We have the signs because people need to think, is it myth or reality? We went through the ancient to the new. We have a thing in space here. People ask all the time, have you found anything yet? And I have to tell them, well, look, if we had, you would have read about it in the papers. We haven't found a signal yet. But the speed of the search is increasing. And consequently, I'm kind of optimistic that we'll find something within a few decades. That's Seth Shostak from SETI. And uh, once we started uh, moving on to everything we do, we are a science and technology as well as a history museum. We had to put some science and tech in there. Um, I was really thrilled that the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, NASA, and SETI came aboard to help us explain some of the things. We do have the wow signal. Um, and Seth is coming in November to talk about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And of course we have our man in black and the artifacts that would be part of Area 51. And atmosphere, because how do you actually take somebody into the most secret place in America and not have the kind of atmosphere that is there? and they do talk about that very hard question, did they reverse engineer in Area 51? And of course we had to have a mothership. And the mothership's actually over some very interesting uh, representational artifact that um, you might not know anything about, but you're gonna have to come to the exhibit to see it. What is required at this time is to make it permissible for scientists to engage in research on the topic without risking ridicule or their livelihood. That's a really profound statement because most people don't feel they can talk about UFOs or the possibility of UFOs or the science of UFOs and still be credible. And being a national museum, we wanted to become a place that people could come and they could actually talk about this without being ridiculed. They could talk about it in scientific ways. They could talk about it in various ways. We have had four lectures so far. We are filming our lectures so that people that can't get to the museum to see them can actually buy the videos. And we have three more this year. I have coming in um, September, senior military officers, including Nick Pope, from the UK um, and the deputy commander of Bentwaters 
They're going to come and they're going to talk about the credible incidences that are unexplained in the UFO world. And then I have SETI coming in November. And then in December, I have reverse engineering and the Red Eagle program. Next year, I'm lining up a number of people, including Ken Collins, who's going to talk about what it's like to fly an SR-71 Blackbird. And I have the head of MUFON coming to talk about hunting UFOs. Of course, we had to have some aliens. And UFO photographs. But when I started to look around for some of the UFO photographs, I wanted something that was before Photoshop, totally untouched, and actually you could tell where it came from. And boy, did I look out. Robert Bigelow of Bigelow Airspace in Las Vegas for 20 years has been collecting just that type of photograph. He has one of the most unseen, unbelievable, archives of UFO photos in the world. And I happened to work with um, Robert Bob Bigelow on another project, and so we actually got access to Bob's uh, photos. And so in this exhibit are untouched, pretty much before 1970, unphotoshopped, real photographs, and they're really high quality photographs. So this was another expert that came on. You can leave now, but remember, this mission may not be over yet. You're seeing some of the 18, you're seeing little bits of some of the 18 videos that we created to take you through this exhibit, including our man in black who occasionally shows up and uh, in the lobby and will talk to you. So, you have an exhibit. We are in a building that is on a campus of a uh, DRI, the Desert Research Institute. It's kind of an uninteresting lobby. So we wanted some stuff to jazz up the, the lobby. This is Robbie the robot, the first science fiction robot. Sorry. Yeah, Robbie is an Eagle Scout project. I had an Eagle Scout come in about a year and a half ago, said, what do you want? I said, you want to build a robot? He said, yeah. He had to have 50 people helping build it, and they are so proud of that. They came and they took pictures. Uh, this is our aliens and our mushroom cloud. Uh, the mushroom cloud, I had an artist do, um, and of course, this is the first thing you see people snapping pictures. We, of course, have our camo dudes. They are the ones that will check your badges, make sure you know your special orders, as you walk into the exhibit. You do have to have a badge to get in. The badges, uh, part of them, have uh, the bios and photos of the actual workers. The other part have uh, bios and photos of aliens. And again, um, where do you get photos of aliens? I had an artist come up and we took every uh, thing we could find about aliens, and they started and they drew them for us, and so this was a project. This is actually mirroring uh, one of the things that we put in our lobby for test site tours. Um, down at the bottom, the prohibited articles that are prohibited articles, you know, on the Nellis test site range and on uh, Area 51, as well as the Nevada test site. Um, if you look here, you can see this is my classification badge to get me on the test site. And this is my camera, federal camera badge, and registers my camera so that I can actually go out to the test site and take photos. And I am only permitted to take them in certain areas. Um, security is very strict on those particular ranges. Of course, this is one of the uh, restricted signs from Area 51. And the extraterrestrial highway. There's a real interesting thing about the extraterrestrial highway. Um, 
One of our board members, former Lieutenant Governor Lonnie Hammergren, is responsible for having it named. And if you know anything about Lonnie, he's a little crazy. And he said, anything that will bring tourists to the middle of Nevada is something I'm going to do. So once we had our exhibit and we had our lobby, we needed to market it. And we wanted to think out of the box. <clears throat> this is the uh, rooftop being painted on our parking structure outside the museum. It has our logo and our name in Area 51 because we are in the flight path of McCarran Airport. And so airplanes go over, uh, including Janet Air, which goes over. Um, and so you have this particular thing that we did. We have our banners. We have our logo on the doors of the lobby, and this is, we also have a lot to do with Coast to Coast. We've been on Coast to Coast. We had uh, a lot of publicity that came out. We've been on with George Norway, George Knapp. Um, we also have the Huffington Post, a number of other places. This is our mobile billboard, both sides. It goes up and down the strip. And so, if you build it, they will come. This is part of the, I don't think this is opening day, this is like a couple days later, but um, you can see that we were extremely busy, the lobby, we had a lot of people out, and this is generated for us, done exactly what we wanted to do, bring in people who had never heard about the museum, and also tell the story of Area 51. Besides this, we do our auxiliary programs, including our lectures. And, you know, and I, while I have spoken many times in public about Area 51 and about Bob Lazar and some of the crazy stuff that's happened, uh, the general topic of UFOs, at least some of these tales here tonight, uh, have not been told in any detail at all. And I'm going to reveal the existence of a witness who was whispering in my ear back then. That's from the George Knapp lecture, and you can see we just kind of left it there, but George did a wonderful two-hour lecture, named names, talked about things he never had, and that's one of the things that people who are coming for the lectures are doing. They're actually doing things they've never done before. Now, I'm going to look up here. That's uh, Dr. John Alexander at the end of his lecture. He's a, um, a former CIA agent, and he has been um, actually looking at UFOs for about 20 years, too. So that's the end of my presentation, or is it? Um, the thing is that this is an ever-evolving exhibit. Every time I turn around, somebody else is calling me on the phone saying, I have this, would you like this? And as more information becomes available, uh, we will be changing this exhibit over its lifetime through, through September 2013, just as we will be bringing in different kinds of people to talk about various aspects of it. Area 51, we lucked out. We lucked out because they declassified the name at the end of, of 2011. And, you know, so instead of <clears throat> Groom Lake, Myth or Reality, I got to say Area 51 for the first time. Because if you talk to these guys, most of them don't talk Area 51. They don't say it. It's all Groom Lake. The other thing is, at the end of last year, the Atomic Testing Museum was designated by Congress as the National Atomic Testing Museum. So we became the first national museum in the state of Nevada. And so those two things have uh, been very interesting, I think. They've changed a lot of what we do. And uh, we're really happy to be here. When Noah called and I said I was going to come, he said, really? And I said, yeah, we'll come out and talk about our exhibit. And we hope you'll come out and, talk and see us at uh, Las Vegas and see the exhibit. you have any questions? Yes. Do you by any chance have, since Google Earth has such good pictures of Area 51, do you have any of those at your exhibit? Um, 
I have some photographs. I also have um, maps that were drawn by somebody out there. I have building um, um, uh, drawings of buildings and their identification done by somebody very much in the know. So yes, I do have those in the exhibit. Yeah. This is not a question, but I was just going to say that it's true that Bob Lazar was in Los Alamos because I worked there on uh, sewing there. I knew him there. Good. So we have somebody else here. Pro a testimony, yes. Any other questions? Thank you very much.